You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech, Future Tech Health Podcast, and I have Nini Rail. Uh, she's an associate professor of chemistry at uh, Thomas Jefferson University. We're going to be talking about cold brew coffee and the acidity and anti- antioxidant activity of it and the, the chemistry of coffee. Since I love coffee, and I'm sure listeners do too, it'll be a great, great call. So, Nini, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. So, how did you, uh, you probably have a dream job. How did you uh, become a, like, a professor of coffee? Well, it's it, it's uh, one of those uh, spontaneous, like you know, serendipity moment because I was actually at a chemistry conference, San Diego, and I was, you know, for all conferences before the morning, you know, morning session, you have to get a cup of coffee, and uh, I walked into one of the coffee store and they had cold brew coffee. I've never heard of that before, so of course I have to try it. And then I tried it. I said, okay, this is pretty good. And I looked up exactly how they were made. And uh, I thought, maybe I could do it myself. And one thing led to another. I started working the chemistry behind it. So uh, the information was not available in terms of how to brew a good cup of cold brew coffee. I stumbled on it and I started working on it. And it's so interesting. A lot of tree going on for cold brew coffee. I just thought right. I should do it. Well, just for listeners, how do you make cold brew coffee and you know, let's go over maybe lightly what happens chemically, and then we'll go deeper after that. Okay, so cold brew coffee is similar, very similarly brewed as a French press. Um, nowadays on the market, there are a lot of um, apparatus or uh, setup that you can buy, and basically involves um, submerging coffee grind in either cold uh, water in the refrigerator or room temperature water over the counter. The key for cold brew coffee is that it is um, brewed for over 8, 10, 12, sometimes even 48 hours, depending on the the brewer. So it is slow, takes time, and very often a lot of drinkers prefer cold brew coffee because they feel like they have a lower So that's why and this, for the summertime, it's very con- people like it. Where does the city come from, or the perception of it when you're doing coffee? Um, coffee has, you know, for, as a natural product, coffee has a lot of organic acid in itself. So when you extract the compounds out of the um, uh, out of the coffee, and then the acids will be out uh, into the coffee brew, and that is the where the coffee the acidity comes from. Right. So what uh, what controls the amount of acidity? You know, how do you know if the coffee's gonna be good or it's gonna be like yeah? And I got had, for instance, you'll, you'll probably be horrified by the story, but in college, I had a friend that was really cheap. So he uh-huh. would <laughs> he would brew coffee for us, and he would keep the grounds in the coffee maker, and then he'd sprinkle on like a very little bit of a short, you know, an extra layer, and he would brew it again through the same grind. And yeah. man, it was so sour, and it was like, Wah. but it was unbelievably caffeinated for some reason. So there are a lot of, um, one of the things that controls acidity, where you get your coffee from. What kind of coffee are you uh, brewing? So um, I at a higher altitude, the berries, the, the, co- the coffee berry tend to have a higher acidity, it's more fruity, whereas as a, low, a, low, a lower altitude, you tend to have less acid, but more caffeine. So there are 
the region of the coffee bean is important, and the other one is the way that it's brewed. You know, for any coffee drinker, if you drink espresso versus、uh, americano versus a filter coffee, and they all taste different because they are brewed differently. That different brewing technique will extract different amount of、um, compounds out of the coffee. So that's another. Um, indicator where the, the whether the off coffee is acidic or not.、Um, the third one is the temperature. Water temperature plays a part in how much the chemicals extracted from the coffee. The higher the temperature, usually the more stuff is extracted. So very often you hear people saying we don't use boiling water. We use a little bit less than boiling. It tastes good. So to some people that temperature adjustment. So there are a lot of ways. So they.、Uh... So the McDonald's coffee that burned that lady years ago, not only was it like ridiculously hot, but it probably tasted gross, and it burned her. <laughs>、um, I, I'm not going to comment on other people's brewing, but I prefer my coffee brewed、um, at just about、uh, 200 degrees rather than boiling. So I like my coffee、oh, wow. a little bit, you know,、um, lower in temp. So what's your goal? Are you trying to? Well, actually, back up and ask a different question. If you have、uh, an inferior bean, you're starting with a coffee that, you know, for whatever reason, you deem it not to be very good. Is there any way of rescuing it and making it delicious, or are you doomed? And you, the starting bean is really what what controls the process. Um, you there are a lot of ways to to rescue coffee. I, I'm not an expert on rescuing coffee. I my just to tie into your future question. Um, my goal is to、uh, provide home brewers with information so that they can adjust their coffee brewing at home to suit their taste. So everybody has a very different. It, the taste itself is very simple. So everybody will. A good cup of coffee to someone might be very. So the the goal is if you understand how the process works, if you understand, we could provide the home brewers with some information about the chemistry in coffee, uh, uh, you know, brewing coffee. Maybe they can tweak tweak their method that they can a cup that is、um, tasty to them. So what are some of the factors that really modulate the flavor profile? What have you found? We we never really tested pro- flavor pro- profile, but according、uh, one of the biggest one is again temperature, and the flavor profile is also very distinct from different、uh, regions of the other factor that dictates flavor is roast, lighter roast and darker roast was very different, and again that is a very subjective aspect of coffee. What do you what what, what do you expect your coffee, right? Uh, I like my coffee a little bit more refreshing rather than that nutty, smoky flavor. So I prefer. A, and then of all the medium roast beans I've tasted, there's one、um, from actually one of my local roasts that is from Mexico, and that is absolutely wonderful.、And、I've tasted other roasts from the same roaster, but this is my favorite. So it's it's very much subjective. So in, like even going back to temperature, have you tried ramping up the temperature through a brew, pulsing it high low? You know, bringing it down a lot near the end. I mean, that, I would think that would modulate things a lot, right? They, they, it will be. And the problem with the, the one of the the um, modulation um, is going to be very hard because coffee brewing is such a fast process. If you think about it,、um, you can do a pour over in a few minutes. And then espresso is literally less than a minute, or maybe a minute. So to modulate temperature in that short period of time is a little bit difficult. So very often people try to find a middle ground to control the temperature,、um, whether they. In, and then not to mention the fact that when you brew coffee, because your coffee grind very often is room temperature, your water is hot. When the water hits The grind, the temperature is going to change. So through that, you can modulate the brewing process, but it is very finicky and then not. It's very hard to control. So this is why everybody's coffee will be different. Morning one might taste a little bit different than the evening, and even if you same everything, one day it might be a little bit different. Is it、this、because is of temperature or because of humidity because too? Like how about the ambient humidity? Oh, everything. Humidity will change because you already have moisture being absorbed into the the coffee grind. That that may that may affect、um, the the extraction process. There there are 
um, the and also the humidity might change the the bean flavor before you before you wrote um, before the grinding. So and we haven't even talked about grinds yet. So so there are a lot of factors that、um, a brewer really need to take into consideration. Most people remember,、uh, oh, I want it roast. Roast is a big thing. Everybody understands light, medium, dark. And if you talk to a lot of、um, coffee connoisseur, they start talking about temp- water temperature. And then there is、uh, coffee grind. The size of the grind that matters because surface area matters. And then if you're talking about some, and then、uh, I went to one of the seminars about how to brew coffee from a professional barista, and he mentioned how much coffee grind versus how much water. That ratio is also going to affect how much the taste of coffee. So we're just listing the, the the obvious variables that people have studied, and there are others that you know in the literature that home brewers probably never thought of, but people think that might be interesting. So, what's your particular area of study? There's so many variables and things you can so, do. So, what's your goal? <laughs> Funny you ask. So, what I'm focused、uh, thing on are two things. Number one is、um, there are two Type of chemicals、um, every coffee paper tend to report on. Number one is caffeine. How much caffeine are you getting from the coffee? Number two is、um, a type of antioxidant compound called chlorogenic acid. Coffee it has a lot of chlorogenic acid naturally, and it is a Beneficial compound in the sense that it is antioxidant. It basically stops、um, scavenge free radicals that may be damaging to our health. And、um, and that that is also it, because it's so prevalent in coffee. Every、um, a lot of re- research are focusing on how this compound change through different conditions in the brewing process. So I look at look that. At, at, Focus on that, and then the third one would be the acidity and antioxidant aspect of coffee. We can look at overall antioxidant level in brewed coffee, and that because people want drink coffee because they think not only for caffeinated reasons, but they also wanted to、um, drink coffee for health benefits because coffee has a lot of antioxidant, and we wanted to ex- look. Into if you start varying some of the variables, what what are how how do how does these very how do these variables affect the、um, the antioxidant level in coffee? And then there are other physical attributes, for example, pH and acidity, which we're not really talking about taste, but it can relate to how we perceive. Um, coffee's taste. So these are the areas that I'm focusing. So、um, and also because、um, I involve my undergraduate students, and these、um, attributes are very easily accessible to my undergraduate student in terms of understanding why they wanted to, why what's going the chemistry in the coffee. What about the things that people add to coffee? Is there anything that people add that really can alter it? You know, the type of milk. Um, cinnamon, chocolate, sugar. Any anything, yeah, absolutely anything you add to coffee is going to alter the the the, the chemistry. Um, I didn't, I haven't spent a lot of、um, research on the additives, but from general re-、uh, literature, anything you add will basically change the the taste because things will. React things will, especially in hot coffee, and then other chemicals introducing other chemicals will also maybe enhance the flavor or maybe allow you to taste things different. So the, for example, the 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 lipids, the fat or the in the cream will allow you to taste different, maybe different aspect of coffee that you may not taste as a black coffee. Okay, I got you.、Um... Have you guys tried to make like a, a very unusual coffee in the lab? You know, a super antioxidant one, or one that has like very unusual taste or properties by experimentation? Um, no, we, I, I, I'm not. I'm such a purist when it comes to coffee. Um, I try not to deviate from the tradition. The traditional way of brewing it. The most we would do is we may roast the beans to very dark and then brew a regular cup of coffee and see what it's like. So we haven't created anything new yet. We're just trying to benchmark and analyze the existing coffee that 
we can brew in the lab. Well, why not? If you do something that's very unusual, then you can put your name on it, you know, mini rail brew and, uh, and sell it and kind of subsidize your research. I think you should uh, go to the extremes and make all kinds oh. of cool stuff. Oh, I know, I, I, I know, I know, and and I just feel, I personally, I feel that there's so much, so much that we don't know, and I always feel like I should understand everything first before I move to the next thing. So I'm still trying to go down the rabbit hole about what is going on in just simple cup of coffee, and there's so many things that we don't understand. I think you should, uh, you should open up your own coffee lab with beakers that you serve <laughs> the coffee in, and. Again, it has your special like scientific recipes or something oh. like that. <laughs> I I mean, it doesn't take a lot, take much for me to get some beakers to to drink coffee. I think I do have a a mug that is made out of a beaker, which is one of my favorite mugs. Oh, well, for customers, you could have a big pipette or a, you know like one of those um, titrating vessels, and you could titrate the milk in and you could oh have yeah, absolutely. Really cool the, place the, to go. Oh, yeah, it would it would be very very fun, and and I, I this is a wonderful thing. I might do that in my lab. There you go. So back to um, your research. So what surprising or interesting things are you seeing just in your you know your run of the mill like cold brew? Um, one of the things we saw that we thought that was quite interesting is that um, the pH between hot and cold. To be honest, they are about the same. To the I mean, what I when when we say that is we. You know, we have this perception of cold brew is slightly um, less acidic than hot brew. If we look at the pH values, which is the the uh, uh, indicator for acidity, a, a common indicator for acidity, we find that our hot brew coffee and cold brew coffee tend to have values that are within within each range. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, yes, there's variation. We're talking about maybe um, 5.1 versus um, 5.05. So the question is, can we consumers taste the difference? Um, probably not, but maybe this small difference will affect our body, but we're, we're not tasting this. So these are some of the things we found that's interesting. Um, the other one that we found that's interesting is that hot brew coffee actually has more antioxidant than cold brew coffee. So one, one quick question on the on the pH. Like why not yeah. have people drink, you know, coffees of different pHs and then test their blood for, you know, levels of caffeine or something, you know, an hour later and see if that affects so, the so, caffeine or something. So um if the pH is not pop up, it's probably not going to affect the absorption of um caffeine. What the pH level would affect how stomach one of one of the the um how 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 your digestive system react um a lot of patients with um GI tract disorders or like acid reflux are recommended to drink cold brew coffee um there's just not enough study to say that cold brew coffee actually is better than hot brew coffee for those who have acid and we are only reporting some of the initial studies we've done on pH and total acidity, hoping this will spark further studies from the medical community to investigate the effect of cold brew coffee on those who have acid reflux or other kind of uh, GI tract uh, disorder. Well, the thing is the body wants to be in a neutral pH, the less burden it has by drinking a low pH coffee the easier it be to digest. But that's just an assumption. Um, yes, and um, and the that the, everybody's body um, kind of works a little bit differently, and uh, also the um, your stomach is actually a very acidic environment, and in it, but there is really no um, and then a lot. There, there are some studies that said that coffee will trigger heartburn and whatnot, but. It's just very inconclusive. So we hope that our study can provide some more info, utilize to even more extensive research on, on this topic. So what other, so all right, the pH doesn't differ very much from hot or cold brew. I don't know, uh, are there other kinds of coffee like Turkish coffee or other ways of brewing that really create a very, very different type of coffee? Um, yeah, uh, there are different different uh, brewing methods would definitely create different uh, different. Um, Co different type of coffee. Our study focused on French press method, 
which is the closest to cold brew method. Again, it involves coffee grind being submerged in water. Um, for cold brew, for cold brew, we're talking about seven, ten, twenty-four hours. For hot brew, we're talking about six minutes tops. And we are we are using we're we're doing everything to the extent. So we are brewing the for the hot brew coffee. We are brewing the hot uh, the the coffee a little bit longer than normal, and we're using boiling water. Not everybody does uh, would do that, but we thought this will guarantee we get everything out of the coffee grind as much as possible in the brew setting. So, uh, and that that's when we discovered that if you use the hot method, you actually will get a little bit more antioxidant out of the coffee than the cold brew method. Is there a trade-off? Is there anything you don't get or you get too much of by doing that? Um, yes, there is a trade-off. I know one of the things um, we we saw from even the earlier paper is that when you are doing cold brew and because you are ex- exposing the coffee grind to water for a long period of time, you get a little bit more caffeine, uh, especially for um, if you use a larger like grind, like coarse grind, and you actually do get a little bit more um, caffeine out of it. So that's great. And the other thing um, people have reported, and we are in the process of coming this, is the um, some the cobra coffee tend to have less bitter taste. So there are a lot of compounds that contribute to the bitter taste, and we're hoping to look into exactly a couple of them and have a see on what whether the cold brew coffee really has less bitter compound hot brew. Well, from what I've heard, I mean, coffee seems to vary very, you know, big time in the amount of caffeine it has, and even decaf too. Did oh, you yes. observe that? Yes, we did. Um, there depend on the region. We have very different. Um, Caffeine concentration and uh, to um, so so we we did one of our um, early studies from we used Kona coffee and then from dark and cold we found that the caffeine concentration actually varied a little bit and uh, for our last co- uh, um, study we didn't really focus on caffeine concentration we only did, um, did antioxidant activities and then from region to region it varies so. Regionality actually do show up in the chemistry profiling of coffee. So why would, for instance, decaf? You know, from what I've read, it can vary tremendously on the amount of caffeine. Why would that be the case? Why wouldn't that process like strip it all out or ninety nine percent of it out? Um, it, it it depends on the process itself, and it also depends on where the beans from. And uh, if if you come to source a bean that is extremely um, high in caffeine content, and then the process may not be effective. And uh, I am not familiar with the decaf process, so I don't want to comment too much on it, but I would imagine that having, I mean, it just depends on the operation itself and then who's doing it, and it's going to vary. Okay. Is there a is there a world record of like the most caffeinated bean out there? That you know um, I I don't know anything that is naturally occurring, um, but I do know there are some uh, beans who have been processed, and then there um, that has quite a bit of caffeine, and the brand name escaped me, and I want to say that it's from New York, the company's from New York, and uh, let me see if I can find. Um, I, I honestly, I, it's somehow okay. that name, yeah, the name escaped me. So I, if I could think of it, and I think one of them is called Dash, Death Wish, and then and there's another <laughs> one, um, that I, I, the one that's not the one I was thinking, and then but but they are um it's called uh depleted adrenal glands, adrenal killer. <laughs> But but yeah, so that's um that's one of the this coffee that has very high caffeine content. I haven't tested yet. I just know that um they yeah. they they I've have heard the brand name and then they they boast uh, the fact that the coffee is potent. All right. Any um any other interesting curiosities in the coffee world that you've run into? Um. So I, well I, I as I said I'm a traditionalist and I tend to go to the more of a mainstream type of coffee but um so i there are certain regions of coffee that i didn't i wasn't aware of so start when after i started my coffee research um friends from overseas would tell me oh we grow coffee um in different regions and one of them that shocked me was taiwan uh one of my uh, my friend who um lives in taiwan 
posted quite a few articles about how Taiwan's coffee industry is bloom, uh, is booming, and uh, it, it's really interesting because that's not a region that you associate with coffee, but yet they're growing coffee. It's in with it's within the the climate of growing coffee. It's just not a big uh, co- coffee growing region, and I just thought it's so interesting that uh, Taiwan is um, has a like, very vibrant uh, coffee scene and coffee um, growing um, okay. activity. What uh, what what makes a really good coffee versus like a disgusting one um you know i don't and all, all i know from every um all the conversations i've had with um friends and colleagues is coffee is very subjective what you hmm. love is what you love and it deviates from what you love and you may not like it um there are coffee i've tasted that people told me oh it's the best coffee in the world and i kind of like yes it's nice um but it's not my type of coffee, whereas my coffee to me is great. When I give it to other people, they were like, "eh." So it, it's I I there is no un I personally don't think there's a universal standard in terms of uh, coffee. Yeah. But um, I would say just talk to people and see what they like, and then experiment and then try things. Maybe you discover something that you never thought before the, to, to try before. But um, it, it is very hard to pin down, like, what is the best coffee? Okay. Yeah. No, I was just curious if there's, like, a, a standard or if you can correlate. You know, at least if most people seem to like this coffee and most people seem to hate this other one, what's the difference there? Maybe you'd be able to do an experiment. Um, the, there are um, – a human, a human subject is very hard to uh, – to, but um, there are some standards in terms of extraction. There are some standards in terms of – like the standard of beans, like the size of the beans, when growers um, um, sort the beans out, there are standards for defective beans and whatnot. And there are some studies um, out there in the scientific community about how to use these um, beans that might be defective, whether it's a size or it's a color or um, for whatever reason, and then maybe make something out of it. So um, there, there are standards, and uh, it, um, very often consumers have a different standard than everybody else. What about uh, microbes? You know, I heard of this coffee mold. Is there molds or fungi or yeast or bacteria that, you know, are commensal with coffee? And do those influence the brewing? And have you studied, is anyone studying that? Um, Not to my knowledge. There are some concerns about coffee brewing, especially in the cold brew community. Um, there are some studies. That, the, so the one of the studies from that um, I came across tested the survivability of various um, microbes in coffee. And we're talking about cold brew coffee. Hot brew coffee is not as um, concerning because the high temperature tend to pretty much sterilize it. Whereas cold brew coffee, you are talking about low temperature, moisture, and it is possible that um, microbes can grow in coffee. So based on that particular study, I believe they tested common ones like E. coli uh, and um, what is a salmonella and some others. And they are not oh, very... Oh, like E. coli. Yeah, yeah E. coli um, of bacteria. And then these, the, the cobra coffee were, doesn't, it's not a very friendly environment to, um, for, for microbes, at least for bacteria. Um, but that I don't think I have came across any mold studies yet. I also didn't look too closely in the mold. We were looking to more thinking about more of a microbial um, bacteria situation. Okay, yeah, you know, I've had like stale coffee or coffee that's gone stale. So I just again, I wonder like what's happening, what's oxidizing over time. So, so uh, I guess there's, there's so many things. There are so many things that's being oxidant, uh, oxidized over time. Um, one of them could be co- um, chlorogenic acids. Um, they are abundant, but they are very easily oxidized. So through with exposure to air, it can lose um, its potency or just ox- re- uh, being oxidized in something else. Um, mm-hmm. The other chemicals, some of the flo- um, you know f- volatile ca- compounds that comprise that basically make up the smell of coffee. As you expose to air for a longer period of time, obviously they are volatile, so they will escape into the air. So it, the coffee doesn't smell or taste as good because the flavors are gone. Um, yeah. So, so all these, so that's why um, you should really store coffee in the freezer and um, 
because it minimizes、mm. the escape. The the volatile compound escaping from the you know from from the the coffee and、um, so and then also、okay. it lasts a little bit longer and、uh, there was actually another study in that basically、um, did a study on how you should grind your and the study found that if you freeze your bean the coffee grind becomes a little bit more uniform and then you know it's it's、oh. better for brewing、uh, brewing coffee so that was a that was a The fraction is、yeah. like more similar size. Yeah. Yes. So the the more uniform the the grind, the again the better the coffee is going to be because、um, huh. extraction it, it controls the the,、uh, the extraction rate. So if everything has the same surface area, everything's going to come out about the same time. So you don't have grinds that being soaked for too long or not not long enough. So there's there's that aspect of coffee brewing as well. And then there, there, there. It's just so many. It's mind-boggling that how many variables control the quality of coffee. No, like in the in this one coffee place I go to, I swear to God, depending on the barista, the coffee is either going to be good or bad. It's the same everything, but some of them just make it awful. And this one guy is my favorite. He always makes it great, and、yeah. I can see like the order of what they do. Like they'll pull a shot, absolutely. They'll put it in the cup first, and then ice on it, or. You know, the shot and milk together, and then the ice last on top, and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's weird. I, I don't know what the guy does. I've asked him, and he he just makes it great every time. It's I don't know, and it's funny. Like <laughs> barista is in a bad mood, they take it out in your coffee, and it comes out bad. I don't know what's happening there either. It's like, it's like it's, crazy number of variables. I I don't know. I I don't have an answer to that, but I could attest to that because my husband and I make the same coffee. His、mm-hmm. coffee came out to be much better than mine, so I usually just, you know, I guess spoiled. I'd have,、uh, you know, a barista at home to make coffee for me, and I, I enjoy every bit of it. But if he's in a bad mood, I bet you his coffee is not as good for some reason. You can tell、um, something's wrong with him.、Okay? Well, in my case, he's always in a good mood. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, oh, you must be a good wife. That's great. You know, it's, it's funny. You know, my wife does. She makes me like this special coffee drink with all this stuff in it. And she'll make it for me, and she'll give it to me, and watch me, and I'll drink it. And sometimes I'm like, "What? What did you do?" And she goes, "What? What is it? What is it?" And you know, and eventually she'll say, "Oh, well, I ran out of this, or oh,、uh, I, I had to do that." You know, like, and I say, "Why don't you tell me? I always can tell." And she just, I think she likes to like test me, and sometimes make it different to see what I'll do. You know, it is very like we we know our coffee. Like there any,、yeah. I, I can I can taste. When when he you know sometimes he ran out of one bean and then、mm-hmm. we have a different bag of beans and then he'll use that and then he'll use a mix between、um, the two beans and I couldn't taste that I was and I was asking I was like did you run out did you run out of the first beans and he was like yeah I only have the other one around so I mixed them I was like yeah yeah it doesn't taste right but it's it, it's a good coffee just I could taste it different so we so he does the same thing to you he doesn't tell you and he waits for you to taste it's it's never really like He didn't tell me. He just made me coffee, and I took a sip, and I turned around to him.、Okay. Says, did you Did you do this? And he was like, Yeah, but he's not trying to hide it from me because he knows, like,、okay. I'll, I'll I'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think a similar dynamic is going on. It goes、yeah. on in millions of households every day. I'm sure. <laughs> well, very cool. So, what's the what's the future of your work? Like, what would be、uh, an exciting result for you to have in the next year or two? Um, we hope to、um, look more in. Like we we wanted to.、So、the last couple、um, project we worked on was more of a preliminary study, almost because we were the first few、um, research groups that focused on cold brew coffee. And because we weren't, I mean, I wasn't. I, we we didn't realize how complex the process is. And there are studies that the experiments we did it came out great, but I think we wanted to control our experiment even more, and then do a little bit more in-depth study on other chemicals in coffee. That the, what's the, for example the flavor compound. We wanted to test some of the smaller flavor compounds in coffee. Compare that. Compare the cold and hot brew methods. See if there's.、Um, Difference in the flavor compounds, and then we also wanted to see if there are any other factors that we can control or we can focus on that can give us more insight on how can we brew a better cup of coffee, or at least how how can we control our coffee brew so that you know、yeah. we could tweak it to our liking. 
So we could, we're looking into like how um, obvious the origins of beans, right? Because that's that's a right. big deal. Um, we could look at, look into how the beans were processed, um, how they're being grown. The, all these things are going to affect the final product. So the mm. and then how how they are brewed. That's cold versus hot, and then. If we change the way that the beans are soaked in water, if we have like additional support, like some of the um, the cold brew setup, can, it's almost like um, you know brewing tea. They have a little container in the middle, and then you put grinds in the middle, and then suspend the container, the the sieve in right. the water. Yep. So, how would that um, type of setup differ um, from a regular? mason jar coffee grind water and then you know soak for a while how what's oh. the difference you know we, we don't know we 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 wanted to understand it and then there is another um brewing method i believe um some groups already looking into that but i also wanted to see what are some of the like you know look into more about um this t- particular type of cold brew so it's a drip method so you drip cold cold water onto a bed of coffee grind and then the water yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. you've seen that huge... like a beautiful um glass um you know setup yes yeah. it's yeah, it, gorgeous and then um so how would this process differ from um a regular again mason jar method right so oh. all these little things in the cold, there's a lot of way creative ways and people are coming up to enjoy coffee and um as these methods come up a lot of consumers want to do them at home, and if I could give them some information to base uh, to, to to you know use, maybe they can um, refine their home brewing and then be able to enjoy um, these um, new creations at home. And that's my ultimate right. goal. Okay, well, that's very cool. So, are there any um, coffee organizations or like coffee summits or conferences or you know for people listening? They won't get this far unless they really love coffee. But, uh-huh. So we're assuming they do, you know, like me and you. But uh, right. like what, how, can, how can they find out more? How can they more, get into more of the world of coffee and learn about all the intricacies and stuff? Um, there are some websites that's out there um, that deals with coffee. And um, I'm I'm blanking a lot of it just because um, I wasn't going to uh, – I wasn't expecting this question, to be completely honest. That's okay. Um, yeah. There's a national – Coffee. Um, there's a, there are a couple international coffee organizations. Was just, um, but have coffee. you seen coffee is big enough of a deal that there's conferences on it? Oh yeah, like there are, there are definitely scientific... conferences. Uh, yeah, there's a conference. There's the international coffee show. Um, there oh, is really? cool. yeah okay. global. Uh, there's internet. Um, there's actually a international coffee organization and. Uh, sure. And and you can go online and then and they have um, expos in in September in Tokyo. They have um, mm. all kinds of coffee. Um, Costa Rica they have another event and then Brazil and there's all over the place. Thailand is so so there are um, there are a lot of information you can find out about coffee and um and and it's really readily available a lot of people are blogging about coffee and a lot of mm. um and and one of the one um local ones for those uh, listening in the states there's a specialty coffee expo and that is going to happen in portland oregon in april of oh, 2020 cool. yeah do you know That's what's going on okay <laughs> cool. excellent excellent Okay, and, and Nini, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and your lab? And you um, know, well, um, they can reach me on um, Twitter. I do have a Twitter account, and uh, I don't use it often. <laughs> so um, my Twitter handle is just my name, and okay. at Nini Rao. N I N Y. N I N Y, yes. And um, so people could reach me that way, and uh, we periodically. Um, I don't have because we're going through a transition right now, and my website is not up. So hopefully in the next um, couple months or so, I will actually have my lab website up to provide people with uh, updates about the lab and research I'm doing. But everybody is welcome to email me. Um, my email would be nini.rao at jefferson.edu. All right. And well, uh, yeah, yeah. So so shoot me an email if you have questions. I'll do my best to answer. Um, I'm definitely not a 
expert in coffee. I'm just starting. I just started this project a couple years ago. I'm so fortunate mm -hmm. that um, I have friends and colleagues so being so supportive. And then, um, and then also a lot of consumers who love coffee. And then um, when I go to conference and we have this wonderful conversation about what they like, what you know, what they want to know about coffee. It inspires me to like trying to do more and then study, uh, understand more about coffee. Very good. Well, Ninia, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.